Hi, Matthias from 10 Minute Physics here. Welcome to tutorial number 18. I'm very happy about the positive feedback I get for the last video on Eulerian fluid simulation. So I decided to create a new one about an extension of that method, which produces, as I think, even cooler simulations. So let's start. Here you see my new demo running in the browser. I put a direct link in the description so you can play with it right away. What you see here is a water simulation using the flip method, which is popular in the movie industry. It is a 2D simulation, but the method works in 3D as well, of course. I will talk about 3D flip and how to extract a water surface in an upcoming tutorial. I like 2D physics a lot though, especially for fluid simulations, because they allow to see what happens below the surface. As you can see, the demo is very fast and very stable and a lot of fun to play with. If you watch the video to the end, I will describe everything that you need to reproduce this demo. Of course, as usual, I will also provide the source code. In the last tutorial, I showed you how to either simulate gases or liquids in separate simulations. Today I will show you how to create a combined simulation of water and air with a free surface in between. The approach is based on the Eulerian fluid simulation method. Therefore, I recommend to watch the tutorial number 17 first. I tried to make this tutorial self-contained though. So here is a short recap of the Eulerian fluid simulation method. We use a grid with two types of cells, fluid cells and solid cells. The fluid itself is represented by a velocity field. We use a staggered grid in which the two components of the velocity vectors are stored in different locations. The horizontal components are stored in the centers of the vertical cell faces and the vertical components in the centers of the horizontal cell faces. In this way we can derive how much fluid flows from a cell to its neighbor in one simulation step. In each simulation step, we first add gravity to the vertical velocity components. Next, we make the fluid incompressible by making sure that the amount of fluid that enters a cell is equal to the amount of fluid that leaves it. Finally, we move the velocity field along itself in the advection step. This time, instead of using two types of cells, we use three types, air cells, water cells and solid cells. The density of water is about a thousand times larger than the one of air. Therefore, we simply treat air as nothing. This approximation still lets us simulate the majority of interesting effects. The two effects that we'll be missing are the wave generation by winds on the surface and the simulation of persistent bubbles. These effects can be added with additional techniques though. This means that the velocities between air cells are undefined. Undefined is not the same as zero, because zero air velocity would stop the water from moving. Now handling two types of fluid cells is extremely simple. First, we simply do not process air cells. The simulator just skips them. Second, we have to make sure that we never access velocities between air cells when we compute interpolations. Now comes the key question. How do we know which fluid cells are water cells and which are air cells? The main idea behind the flip method is to use particles. The particles are simulated and have a position as well as a velocity. Now the water cells are simply the fluid cells that contain particles. This basic method is called PICK or particle in cell method. Here you see an overview. We first simulate the particles as simple moving mass points. Then we transfer their velocities to the grid. Next we make the grid velocities incompressible as in the Eulerian fluid simulation method. Finally, we transfer the velocities back to the particles. Since particles carry velocities, we can skip the advection step of the Eulerian method. Unfortunately, the PICK method introduces quite a bit of numerical viscosity. Here, we see the situation in a cell before transferring the velocities stored in the grid back to the particles. Each particle has its own independent velocity. However, after the transfer, the particle velocities are smoothed because the velocity field stored in the grid has far less degrees of freedom than the velocities stored on the particles. So after the transfer, most of the individual particle motion is lost. The FLIP method reduces this problem. FLIP stands for Fluid Implicit Particle. As in the PICK method, we first simulate the particles. We also transfer the velocities of the particles to the grid. Before the solver modifies the grid velocities, we store a copy of them. Next, we make the velocity field incompressible as before. However, instead of transferring the velocities of the grid to the particles, we add the velocity changes to the particle velocities. 
This technique reduces the smoothing of the particle velocity substantially. However, the velocity field stored on the particle builds up a substantial amount of noise. The best results are generated by a mixture of the two methods. Here you see the noisy motion of the particles with the pure flip method. Here you see the smooth fit motion generated by the pick method. I use 0.1 times pick plus 0.9 times flip for the demo. Let me now explain all the steps in more detail. The particle simulation step is very simple. Particles store a position x as well as a velocity v. In a two-dimensional simulation, both have two components, x, y and u, v respectively. As usual, I use bold face for vectors. To simulate the particles, we iterate through all of them. First we add gravity times the time step size to the velocities. Then we add the velocity times the time step size to the positions. This method is called semi-implicit Euler integration. It produces the ballistic motion of unconstrained particles. At the end of this step, we also need to push particles out of obstacles if necessary. Transferring the velocities between the grid and the particles is a little bit technical. It's pretty simple to implement though, as you can see in the code. In this example, we have a particle at the position x with coordinates xp and yp. First we need to find the cell that contains p. The cells are labeled with two integer values x cell and y cell. We find the cell coordinates by dividing the particle coordinates by the spacing h and round down. In our example, if we divide xp by h and round down, we get 2. If we divide yp by h and round down, we get a 1. 2 and 1 are the coordinates of the cell that contains p. We call the remainders of the division delta x and delta y. Let me first explain how to transfer a general quantity q from the grid corners to a particle. In this example, q is closer to the corner number 2, so we want qp to be closer to q2 than to q1, q3 or q4. For this we compute four weights w1, w2, w3 and w4. Using bilinear interpolation, we get these definitions of the weights using the offsets delta x and delta y. These weights are used to compute qp as a so-called weighted sum of the corner values. We need to be careful if one or more of the values are undefined. If q2 is undefined, for example, we simply drop it from the numerator as well as the denominator. In a staggered grid, we have to consider the specific locations of the velocities. For instance, the u components are stored on a grid that is shifted down by half the grid spacing. We can simply handle this by using y minus h over 2 as the y coordinate of the particle in the equations before. To transfer the quantity from the particle back to the grid, we compute weighted sums on the grid corners. For this, we need a sum of weights r on each corner. First, we clear the q and the r fields. Then each particle adds its weighted quantity q and the corresponding weight r. Finally, we divide all weighted sums by the sum of weights in each corner. Once the velocities are transferred from the particles to the grid, we want to make the velocity field on the grid incompressible. This step is called projection and is identical to the projection step of the Eulerian simulation method. To make this tutorial self-contained, I briefly explain it again. For a given cell, we first compute the divergence, which is the total outflow. If u i plus 1 on the right is positive, fluid flows out of the cell, so we use a positive sign. On the other hand, if u i on the left is positive, fluid flows into the cell, so we use a negative sign. If d is positive, we have too much outflow. If d is negative, we have too much inflow. Only if d is 0, we have an incompressible fluid. To make the diversion zero, we need to modify all the velocities by the same amount. Here, one fourth of the divergence. To handle obstacles or walls, we assign a value s to each cell. We set the value to zero for solid cells and to one for water or air cells. Then we add the yellow modification to the correction step. To solve the entire grid, we use multiple iterations. In each iteration, we run through all the water cells. For each water cell, we perform the projection step as discussed before. This method is called the Gauss-Seidel method. It's probably the simplest method to solve systems of equations. We have to be careful. On the boundary, we access cells outside of the grid. One solution to this problem is to add boundary cells that we do not change. 
we either set them to walls or copy the values of neighboring cells that are inside the grid. As we saw, the gauss seidel method is very simple to implement. However, it needs more iterations to converge than global methods. Here is a simple trick to speed up convergence dramatically. It's called over-relaxation. After implementing all of this, we get the following result. The problem is partly caused by the low iteration count and the large time step size I use. We could reduce this problem by increasing the number of iterations or decreasing the time step size, which is typically done in offline simulations. However, we want the simulation to be as fast as possible to run inside a browser and using JavaScript. The main problem we have is drift. All purely velocity-based methods have this problem. The solver sees that velocities tend to make particles collide. However, it does not see if particles are already colliding. Two fixes are necessary to fix this problem. First, we need to push the particles apart. We could simply check all pairs. Unfortunately, this would be very slow. I use a grid to speed up these checks. In tutorial 11, I explained in detail how this can be done. Alternatively, you can just check the code. Even after pushing the particles apart, the solver still doesn't notice if too many particles are located in one cell. To fix this, we compute particle densities at the center of each cell. To compute it, we first set all density values to zero. Then we run through all the particles. Each particle adds its interpolation weights to the four corners. Since the four weights add to one, we get a smooth estimate of the number of particles in each cell. Now we use the particle densities to modify the divergence. We reduce it in dense regions. This has the effect that the solver creates more outward push in dense regions. The rest density, rho zero, is the average density of water cells before the simulation starts. The parameter k is a stiffness coefficient, which I set to one in my code. This concludes the tutorial. Thank you for watching, I hope you had fun, and I see you in the next one.